Um, so yeah, good morning, everyone. I see a bunch of you out there um, in little tiny font. I can make your font bigger. Hello. So you'll notice it's just me this morning. Um, this is because the plague seems to be going through our office. And I will figure out how I want to have all of the layouts at some point. Um, so uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, actually just one week ago, um, myself, Big J, who you all know from the stream, um, James, our project coordinator, and several other members of the CosmoQuest collaboration were at the American Astronomical Society meeting down in Washington, D.C. And we still owe you more updates from that. But um, one of the reasons I look slightly blurry today and Big J isn't here is um, there appears to be a plague upon our travels, um, literally. Uh, I was quite sick um, last Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, I got back to streaming on Friday, but um, it's I'm still not fully over it and definitely overdid yesterday. Um, today it has taken Big J and I'm hoping that no one else on our staff gets eaten by this bug, whatever it is that it may be. Um, it's true paranoia. There are recent studies showing that it wasn't rats that spread plague, but rather humans were the primary characters. Um, I, in this case, um, am fully willing to blame um, astronomers for spreading this particular viral disaster. Um, so yeah, uh, our, our normal, uh, gleefully, depressingly, however it is that Windows makes us feel, telescope assembly uh, is going to be stretched out a little bit longer. Um, but I wanted to give you some updates on things. And, and we do wash our hands, just we don't cover our mouths, apparently. Um, yeah, life, the universe, everything, in this case, plague. Um, so, so there is a big box behind me that you can see. It's over. I can't do this. It's over there. There it is. It's um, behind me leaning against the bookcase. That is a new uh, telescope from Celestron that is actually Mac compatible, which I am blissfully, stupidly happy about. Um, that's the optical telescope tube assembly over there. Um, I have the drives and everything piled up in the chair directly behind me. You can sort of see a box creeping through the wind, creeping through my chair background. And over time, we're going to work on getting all of this put together. Um, I, I may open the boxes to show off the shinies today, um, but the boxes are heavy and my studio is on the second story of my house. And um, I'm contemplating how much I want to carry things back down the stairs once they're fully assembled. Um, our ultimate goal is to have a uh, telescopes that we can use to take our own astro images that are authentic to how hopefully a really good amateur will take images um, that we can use to teach you guys how to do CCD data reduction, how to observe transient objects, how to do a lot of really cool science. And wow, you guys are chatty. I can't keep up with the chat. I have to move this window so I can see it. Um, uh, Good afternoon, Ashbin. Um, the fully assembled thing will fit down the stairs because you can fold up the legs of the tripod, um, but it will take two people to tilt it at an angle. I live in a old uh, Victorian house, which means the back stairwell um, is designed for short, small people. Um, and the front stairwell is made out of oak and I'm not going to take a telescope down an oak stairwell because I don't know which would get harmed more and I want neither to be hurt. Carpeting. Carpeting is the key to everything. Um, and um, yes, Big J does send me screenshots of his completed assignments so that I can tell him when he needs to be off studying. Um, hey, Peter. Um, uh, Yes, I think being gay is normal, especially when it's your last name. I can can we get a mod in here? Um 
So that was a random question. Okay. Um, so I do answer questions and science has shown that across most biological entities there is a range of both gender orientations and sexual orientations that are decoupled to your physical structure. This is science folks. You can have whatever opinion you want. Science shows we are all wired the way we are wired and we are wired in a variety of delightful ways. All of who can do science. Um, so yes. Um, all are welcome. And, um, I need to appoint more mods on this channel. I'm realizing, um, if I'm looking all over the place, it's cause I have multiple screens up. Um, and, and that's, uh, just requires me to look in all sorts of different directions. Um, so, so yes, now, you know, um, more science than you're intending for the morning. Um, random, off-topic, awesome story. There is a very dedicated, in-love pair of physically male flamingos at one of the zoos in Florida. And flamingos mate for life. And these two gents have been together for a long period of time. And there is a heteronormative couple of flamingos who had an egg that they abandoned. And so the zoo gave the egg to the male couple who were never going to be able to have their own egg together. And the couple raised the egg lovingly. And it's one of those truly beautiful stories from animal science that I truly adore. Um, so, so now you know, one of my favorite random, random science stories. Okay. Um, appointing more mods. Um, you know who you are, usual suspects. Um, I think I did that right. I might have, I might have done that wrong. It's not giving me messages as to what it is I'm doing. Um, aha, yes, I did that right. Okay. Um, yes, and now the baby flamingo has a great and compassionate life. Um, there. Okay, so we have a couple more mods. Um, and life will hopefully be better. And the chat is overwhelming everything. I'm trying to find like the perfect compromise on this layout for how to lay out the chat. And it's it's tricky. Um, so my goal is to not just sit here nattering today. That is not my goal. That is simply what has so far happened. Okay. Um, so we had a troll. The troll has now been dealt with. Um, and um, so my goal for today was to talk to you about the software that we're going to be developing that is the reason that we have a growing number of telescopes. Um, and, and the software that we're developing, we named it Transient Trackers because I like alliteration and I wrote the grant along with Jake Noel Starr and uh, he let me keep the alliteration. And the, the idea behind Transient Trackers is there are a lot of phenomena in our sky that are there for a moment and then gone or are changing. These are things that uh, are transient. That's the name. And to do science with them, we have to track them. Now, the primary way that I've always worked on studying these things, and this is finally science it's near and dear to my heart, so you get to hear me wax glowy eyed about science. I love. Um, these are the kinds of things that you can go spend your night outside, uh, looking up with a telescope, taking image after image after image, and the image looks like something. If you're doing stellar spectroscopy, your images look like nothing. If you're doing galactic astronomy, your lines look like nothing with fewer bits of nothing in them. Um, but with photometry, you're taking images that really, you can see the sky, you can see it in amazing detail. And I'm going to pull up the image of what I stared at for my entire um, master's thesis 
trying to figure out where it's going to open and I'll share it with you in just a moment. Um, thanks Dodgy Blaster for the subscription. You make me happy. Um, I don't know why the animation didn't animate. That makes me sad. There should have been like happy little comets that went flying past. Um, okay. Um, so let me make this fit into the part of the screen I'm going to share with you. So for my master's thesis, I studied the Ursa Minor Dwarf Seroidal Galaxy. And if you put too much of Photoshop off the edge of your screen, it breaks. Okay, so let me switch views to this one. Whoa, I made the chat super tiny. Let me fix that. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm going to figure this chat out eventually, just maybe not today. Um, okay. I don't know cosmic lettuce about what your sound problems are. I'm so sorry. Okay, so this field opened in Photoshop. Let me make it bigger. This is the Ursa Minor Dwarf Seroidal Galaxy. I swear to God, there is a galaxy in this image. I stared at it for over a hundred nights working on my um, master's thesis. Now the reason I've opened it in Photoshop is so that I can draw on it, um, which isn't something that uh, most software lets you do with pictures like this. So um, any of you want to make a guess at where in this image um, that dwarf galaxy is located? Looking to see yeah, I spent over 100 nights staring at this field. And let me up the contrast on this, which is something that I can do because I opened it in Photoshop. Um, this is a color image made by combining uh, RGB images. I really want to like, oh shoot, I'm doing this wrong. Um, I really want to figure out how to redo this a little bit better at some point. And it looks like I'll be able to do that using these three images. For now, let me flatten the image. Still waiting to see. Nope. So, so I was studying variable stars in the Ursa Minor Dwarf Seroidal Galaxy. So you're looking for a galaxy that you can see individual stars in using this particular image. So this is this is a trickster galaxy. It actually wasn't discovered um, until fairly recently, even though it takes up about a whole degree of the sky. So there we go. That's a little bit better contrast on this. So are any of you seeing my trickster galaxy yet? Um, So, so this entire field, I'm using the McDonald Observatory 30-inch telescope to make this observation. Um, the field of view of the telescope is 55 arc minutes across. Um, it's a square field, 2048 by 2048 CCD. And um, it's, it is a satellite galaxy. This is a dwarf spheroidal galaxy. And as someone who really struggles with my S sounds, saying dwarf spheroidal almost killed me when I presented my master's thesis. Um, but it's here, one of the smallest satellite galaxies by mass orbiting our Milky Way galaxy is in this field. Um, so yes, this field is about twice the size of of the moon and cosmic lettuce you got it um so if you look along the diagonal here there is an over density of stars and this is actually the ellipsoid of the ursa minor dwarf seroidal galaxy so my goal in lining up the telescope each night was to get this bright star which is a foreground star this little triplet of stars which are also foreground stars um, to be roughly centered in my CCD and all these little background objects, this image goes down to a magnitude of about 21 um, with good signal to noise. It goes with bad signal to noise down to a, about 23. Um, it may go fainter than that. I'm just not remembering my master's thesis it was a long time ago now, but I get to go back to this kind of research. Um, hello, Arcade Rob. Um, so this is not a random cluster, Octocoron. This is 
a dwarf galaxy. And the way that we actually find dwarf galaxies orbiting our own galaxy is counting stars. Um, you, you look above and below the disk of the Milky Way galaxy, and you preferably use software to count stars. And you look for the places in the sky where um, there are more stars than you would expect. And that's where there's a dwarf galaxy. And when you see places that have fewer stars than you'd expect, that's where there's a blob of gas and dust getting in your way. Um, yes, this sounds like work. Um, but this is what software is for. Um, so... Yes, Big J, you do know some software that counts objects in images. Um, so yeah, I, that's a good way of phrasing it. There, there's between a dozen and a bazillion stars here. So this is the Ursa Minor Dwarf Spheroidal Galaxy. And there are over a hundred variable stars in this field. These are stars that for a variety of different reasons change in brightness on the order of minutes, hours, and days. Most of the ones that I was interested in are our Lari variable stars. These are variable stars that are very poor in metal. This means the star itself probably doesn't have any planets orbiting around it. They're made uh, from some of the oldest material in our universe that hasn't been recycled that many times through supernovae. And um, our Lari stars are themselves older stars. We see them in galaxy cl non galaxy clusters. We see them in globular clusters. We see them in the outer spheroid of our own galaxy. They're fairly small. They're fairly faint. We can't see them readily in other galaxies like Cepheid variable stars, which are their much better known variable cousins. But our Lari stars and Cepheid variable stars are both pulsating variables. They're both the kind of star that physically changes in size and color. Our Laris, they do it in a matter of hours to a little over a day. Cepheids do it typically multiple days. Our Laris uh, are also driven by a different energy generation mechanism. So they tend to all be the exact same brightness. They're what are called horizontal branch stars if they have the same composition. Um, and so what's cool is you can use these stars to start to get at hints of what is the metallicity of a system? How long has it been evolving for based on what kinds of variable stars you see? You can do all sorts of really cool stuff with variable stars, not just with the Cepheids that everyone talks about for distance measurements. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of cool stuff you can do with this image. The trick is that to do that cool stuff, um, you have to be able to measure a lot of characteristics of these stars. Um, hey, Veronica Cure, welcome. Um, glad to see you here. Um, so, so yeah, Man of Steel Astrology is, is based on uh, basically tables of charts made up by people who were trying to design a way to understand their future before there was science. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is an astrophysicist who worked on supernova back when I was still in high school. Um, so um, yeah, different story. Um, but yeah, thank you, Veronica Cure, for joining. Um, and yes, I have met Neil deGrasse Tyson. I have even shushed him at one point so that I could get a point across in a panel. Anyways, um, this is this is a cool field to study. It is a hard field to study because you need a telescope that has a large field of view, a high resolution spectrum, uh, a high resolution CCD imager, and um, the telescope needs to be big enough that you can see faint, faint stars. But it's fun to do this kind of science. And while this field is hard to study, there are lots of fields out there that are easy to study. And we're writing software to allow any of you who has some sort of a digital camera, and you can actually do some of this science just using a Canon DSLR camera. Um, we're working on writing software to allow you to, to do science with these kinds of image. Now, it's not straightforward to understand how to do science with an image like this.
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in as far as I can zoom in rationally. And this is um, a TIFF image. So it's, it's in color and actually, let me switch this. I can revert this so that we're only looking at a single filtered view. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch it. So we're only looking at, actually, let's switch it so that we're only looking at the image that was taken through the blue filter. Let me make this black and white. Uh, yes, go ahead and flatten, discard. So this is what the image coming off the CCD would look like. You can see that each star has its own different profile of light. You can see that there's background noise in here. And what I'm going to do is, let me get, there's some bright stars right off the top of the screen. And um, I see that Keeper of Maps ask a question. Why must be a CCD? It doesn't have to be a CCD. What you need is either a charged couple device, a CCD, or a CMOS chip. You need a digital detector of some sort. You can do this with glass plates, but then you have to scan them. It's a lot more work. It's not a linear representation. So let me open up my, my air server, and I'll start to make this a little bit more clear once I can draw. There we go. Come on, you can do it, little computer. It's actually a big computer. It's old. That's why it's slow. Um, come on. Oh, my Apple Pencil died. That's the problem. OK, so putting my Apple Pencil into its charger, turning the Apple Pencil off. There, now I can write. OK, so. I'm going to try and fit a drawing piece in here down beneath the star so that we can see both at once. Um, of course it's an apple. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. I'm trying to keep my competition far, far away. Um, uh, so Cosmic Lettuce, I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to be on as long as I'm blathering about this. Um, so I'm going to try and do a solid uh, explanation. I'll be on at least another half hour, possibly a little bit longer. Um, OK, so I no longer have a stylus I can write with. This is going to be challenging. Um, the way, let's see if I've charged it enough that it'll pretend to work. Apples are good that way. Yes, I have. OK, the world is not over. I can now use my Apple Pencil again. Um, so the way this works is say I want to um, understand what's in the sky. Now the reason that I, um, oh, Cosmic Lettuce wants to be notified, follow. So if you're watching this on Twitch, there should be a follow button at the top. If you click follow and you turn notifications on on your phone for the Twitch app, you should get a notification every time I go live. Um, it's, it's fairly non-intrusive. It's just like any other notification like you might get from YouTube. Um, and we'll get to see if the, app, if the animation goes off when you do it. Um, so, so yeah, that should let you know if I come back later today. Um, OK, back to explaining about the CCD. Um, so both CCD detectors and CMOS detectors are digital detectors. And the way they work is they have a bunch of little pixels um, that are actually symmetric. And let me turn off my auto squaring feature. So I have graph paper. Let's say that this graph, each uh, square in the graph is a bin. So this pixel here has essentially a bucket associated with it. And when a bit of light, a photon, hits the pixel, that can, if it is 100% quantum efficiency, cause an electron to build up inside that bucket. Now, the truth is, I have terrible handwriting, and I'm going to redraw that. The truth is that 
it's going to take more than one photon hitting that pixel because we don't have pure quantum 100% quantum efficiency where every single photon gets turned into an electron in that bucket. But it is a linear relationship where there's a direct correlation between how many photons of light hit the pixel and how many electrons build up in that bucket. Um, and thank you for joining Cosmic Lettuce. I hope we'll see you more later. Um, so as more and more photons hit the pixel, it fills up with electrons. And you have a bunch of different pixels next to each other, actually forming a grid. And if one of these overflows, it'll actually start dumping electrons into the bins nearby. This is why sometimes when you see images like this one, you'll see bright streaks. That's where the pixels began to overflow and they tend to flow column wise. So overflowing, overflowing electrons tend to run in one direction down the CCD chip. But as long as you don't overflow your buckets, as long as you don't overfill your buckets, there's a direct relationship between number of photons and the amount of charge that's collected by that bucket. And we can refer to that as the number of counts collected in that bucket. And when we get one of these images, as long as the image is never compressed, what we can do is we can reconstruct how many photons hit each and every pixel. Now, the reason that compression is a problem is with compression, if you have a bunch of pixels where like the center one has maybe 10 counts and then the ones here have nine, actually those are bad numbers. Let's, let's make these bigger numbers so it makes more sense. So let's say the center one had, um, and I'm going to need a smaller brush. Let's say the center one had a hundred counts in it. And this one had 80 and this one had 82 and this one had 84 and this one had 82. Um, this one also had a hundred because it's an elongated object. If you have compression, this will get rewritten during the compression process to try and um, make it so that the the array that all this information is stored in doesn't take up as much space on your hard drive. So in the um, compression project process, it will take things that are roughly the same and give them all the exact same value. So suddenly what we'll find is our 82s get lumped in with that 80 and we lost information. Um, not all compression is lossy, but all the compression that we can't deal with is lossy. So this does look like Minesweeper, you're right. Um, so, so lossy compression is the death of CCD um, and CMOS uh, ability to do science with the data. So if your digital camera is automatically saving everything to JPEG, you can't use that data to study a lot of components of science. Um, you instead need to be storing it as TIFFs, you need to be storing it as RAW, you need to be storing it in one of these formats that doesn't lose information. So yeah, Keeper of Maps, that's a good way to put it. Uh, cheap compression is lossy. lossy. Um, so we need data where where all information is kept, uh, where nothing is lost, and and once we have that, we can then start to math it. Now, the cool thing with this is, let me get a clean slate here. When when we're looking at these images, and let me switch how I'm drawing. Let me get a pencil. Um, so let's say I'm looking at an inverted version of my image. I have a, um, star here in the center. And when I look at the star, if it's perfectly centered on the pixel, 
I'll get this array of less and less detections all the way around it, roughly in a circle. And this is what we see on the screen. So when you look up at the image I made, you can see here that I have, and let me inverse this so that both images are being shown the same way. Adjust, invert, there we go. Um, so you can see that in the center, I have a lot of detection. And then there's less and less detected in the outer edges of the star. Now, if I make a plot of just down this one line through the CCD, if I make a plot of X pixel, so just where I am in the CCD, and then um, brightness, actually we call that counts, so let me use the actual words, and counts, what you'll find is you theoretically have this nice smooth curve. And the curve itself, the reason that we have it is because physics, optics, and our atmosphere all work to spread the light out from the star. Uh, with the optics itself, if we were able to get perfect laser light focused through our system and everything was perfectly collimated, perfectly in focus, we'd get what's called an RE disk pattern where at the very center you have a bright point and then you have a series of rings around it. Um, we pretty much never actually see that. Um, what we see instead is this spread out light from the star that is how well the optics have resolved the star and then the background of space gets in the way of everything else. Um, this resolution, the resolving power of your telescope, if you can resolve things too greatly, one of the problems you can run into that I've run into is uh, you end up with stars that are a single pixel and you can do no science with that so you unfocus your telescope. I have actually unfocused a telescope to prevent my stars from being squares. Uh, you need to have this disk and the reason you need to have this disk is one of the ways we get at measuring stars is we find, that was the wrong brush, we find the maximum, so here's my max, and then we find the point where, so this is one, two, three, four, five. So we find the half maximum value. And we use the fullness of this curve at that half maximum value to get a sense of how well focused our system is, of how big the object is. And for point sources like stars, every single star in an image should have the exact same full width half max because that's how the optics are able to resolve the star. If it's only a pixel, we can't differentiate stars from cosmic rays. Um, all these sorts of different things. Um, hey Guido, welcome to the group. Um, oh, it's okay Guido. We're glad you're here anyways. Um, <laughs> sorry to get sidetracked everyone. Um, okay, so, so looking out across our image, the way that we're able to start distinguishing things is uh, stars all have one full width half max, all of them. So we'll call that full width half max star. Galaxies are not equal to stars. Galaxies 
uh, they're not point sources. They're bigger, they're blobbier in angular resolution on the sky in general. I mean, there's a, there are exceptions, but uh, they're super distance things like uh, quasars that we're only actually seeing the accretion disk in the center of the galaxy glowing. But in general, galaxies are going to have um, the, the full width half max of a galaxy. Um, I'm going to call this gal. Actually, let me use a symbol for this. So there's my galaxy symbol. The full width half max of a galaxy is generally going to be greater to the full width half max of a star. So when we want to look, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There you go. Um, so in general, if you want to understand um, how we separate stars from galaxies, one of the ways we do it is we actually look at this profile of the star. Now, a lot of times your stars aren't actually round on your images. In fact, if, if we go back to looking at my image, you can see that they're slightly elongated in one direction. Um, that is because uh, tracking. Um, lots of various different things can affect how well your star stays exactly centroided so that the um, brightest point in a star stays on the exact same pixel for an entire observation. The reality is, and here I need a tube of some sort. I can make a tube. I have that ability. Okay, so you have your telescope and let me wrap this. And I'm making a telescope out of a random old name badge. Okay, so I have my wannabe telescope. When it's pointed straight up, looking at something straight ahead, gravity is like, cool, this is easy. But as soon as you start to tilt it a little bit off of straight overhead, gravity is trying to pull it. So the poor innocent motors in the telescope are, are trying really hard to move this thing in a very precise way that allows it to track across the sky exactly matching the rate that the Earth is rotating. Gravity is fighting it. Sometimes you have wind fighting it. And how much gravity fights it depends on where you are in the system. So all these different things can cause your images um, to, to not be perfect. So in these images that I took with the 30 inch at McDonald Observatory, um, I was looking at a galaxy that liked to dip itself down into the mountain each night. It would, it would be set by the mountain before it was set by the horizon, which always made me sad. Because the telescope wasn't straight up, because it was over, not a lot, but enough to be annoying, um, there was always this slight elongation. So when I'm measuring the full width half max, I want to measure this full width half max in both directions. And this will tell me what does a star look like. And once I know what a star looks like, I have two different things that I look at. I look at the full width half maximum of the star in the x direction. And then I also look at the full width half max in the y direction. And then I do the ratio um, of full width half max star in the x direction full width half gah okay can't write and talk half max in the y direction and this ratio tells me how elongated my objects are and in theory and the reason I say in theory here is is because of optical issues. In theory, that ratio should be constant across the entire field for stars. And so you can now identify stars as things that have this ratio full width half, full width half max in X and Y and this typical 
full width half max and I'm not writing on a screen you can see again thank you there we go um, so um, these are how we differentiate stars now the real issue that we also run into is with actual data so here's our detector um, if we're trying to look at a grid of stars such a thing does not exist we wish it did in reality we might look at a globular cluster or an open cluster more likely because they're easier to deal with what you'll find is you might have perfect stars in the center and then as you go outwards they start to get more and more deformed in different ways and this can be due to different optical aberrations. It can be due to having your telescope not properly collimated. There are lots of things that can go horribly, horribly, horribly wrong when you're observing. So it turns out that when you're observing, the natural human inclination is to focus your telescope by um, focusing the center part here. That's wrong. Don't ever do that because it turns out the bulk of your field is out here. So focus your telescope. So the donut around the center is the most in focus. That will give you a much happier experience. So um, yes, all of this was observed from McDonald Observatory in West Texas um, when I was a graduate student. Um, we will have our own example images to use, but first we have to all stop getting sick. Um, we, we currently have a plague going through our office, it appears like. Um, so this is the basics of, of what we're looking at. Now, what this is starting to get the hint of, and let me get myself back a little bit more screen. When, when I'm making observations, the first thing that I want to do is I need to find this star. So I write software that walks across the image. Let me pull my image up behind this again. So I want to walk across the image and I want to, and I don't know if I can do this with Photoshop, um, I want to identify that star. That did not do what I wanted. Um, pardon me for a moment while I make Photoshop do my bidding in a way I like. There we go. So the first thing I want to do is I want to identify all of these stars. And it's determined to not do what I want it to do. Okay. Uh, so ideally I have software that goes through and it marks the centers of each of these different stars. And I, I was trying to do hollow fill. It doesn't, I have too many pixels set up um, and I'm zoomed in too far. Fine. I will go ahead and change this so that I can do this in real time to make people happy. Um, that came out more sarcastic than intended. I'm just annoyed that Photoshop didn't do my bidding. Okay. So come on, give me the circle tool back. Where did you go? Cancel. Okay. So um, I want it to go through and I want it to find all of these objects. And when it finds them, um, once it finds them, the next thing it does. So I have a step one is find. So find that brightest pixel in the center. Step two is measure full width half max. And I ran out of screen while trying to write that. Sorry, let's try that again. One, I want to find. Two, I want to measure full width half max. Now I can only measure the full width half max um, if it's non-compressed data so or non-lossy compressed data. So 
Uh, you can find things on a JPEG, you can find things on any kind of image you want. Um, I can only start to do the star galaxy separation if I have um, no lost data. Um, I, you don't need to see the bottom right now, but sure, I can do that. Okay, there we go. That should be more pleasing. Um, so the next step, once you've found things, is now you can start to measure the light. And this is the next thing that Big J is going to be forced to measure. Um, he actually likes his job, but I'm forcing him to do it, and he's enjoying it. Um, so the starlight, as you can start to see in my graph, it goes out much further than this full width half max. So we actually generally measure all the light out to somewhere between four to six full width half max. And the way we measure that light is there's going to be some background layer of light that's, that's absolutely everywhere. Um, so in my image, I have just this background layer of light. And everything else is kind of on top of this background layer of light. And so what I have to do is subtract off that background. And once I've subtracted off that background, I have to measure all the remaining counts that are within that four to six full width half max. It's just an easy sum. Um, yes, you can totally view this video later, Cosmic Lettuce. Um, <laughs> we're here to help you. Don't worry about it. Um, okay. Um, so, so here we have four to six full width half max measure all the counts within that. So this starts to tell you where your star is in your image. Um, is it a star or a galaxy? Because we have the ratios of the full width half max. And how much light was detected? And this is where things start to get cool if you're me. Because to, to make this background image that you see, I, I took hundreds of images. Um, this isn't hundreds of images co-added. This is like one night when I was bored, I co-added a bunch of images and it was that night's images. Um, but because I have night after night after night of images, I can over time see how Oops, that was a useless pencil. Um, let me switch to a useful pencil. I can see over time. So here I have time and here I have counts. So for a given star, what I'll see is a pattern like this. Now the reality is that the sun will periodically come up. And I'll be missing chunks of that because the sun comes up and I curse the sun. But with all these different bits and because it's a constant sine wave, I have the ability to take all this information and let me remove that so I can write right there. Um, what I can do is take time and fold it up and I'm going to call this phase. And so I'll have that first bit that started to come up. And I drew that badly. Let me redraw that. So I have this first bit that comes up. Then I have this next bit that comes up. And hopefully they all overlap. I have this bottom part that comes down. And over time, over lots of different nights, I'm able to put together all the information. And, um, this allows me to calculate how it is that this star is changing in brightness over time. And one of the really cool things is stars, because they follow the exact same physics as musical instruments, as any resonating cavity, I can start to get at the density of the star. I can start to get at all sorts of cool information such that if I measure 
how the star's period changes over time. And we've been observing some of these things for well over 100 years. We can actually measure in detail stellar evolution using variable stars, which is what I did as an undergrad. Um, I didn't do my PhD on this stuff because I was told variable stars aren't interesting and there's no career in that. Go forth and study galaxies, young girl. Um, and I did, and I like variable stars better. So I'm now going back to where my passion truly lies, as you can tell. Um, so yeah, there's always stars in the sky. The problem is sometimes the sun doesn't let you see the ones you're interested in. Sometimes even the moon makes it so you can't see the stars you're interested in. The stars that I'm observing here, because they're so faint, I could only observe them after twilight was completely over and when there wasn't a full moon. Um, and that means that I have lots of random images I took of pretty things that were bright that I could see while I was waiting for the rest of the sunlight to go away in the early parts of twilight. Um, so, so measuring counts allows you to start to get to brightness. Now, the other thing that we do with all of this, and I'm going to just bring up a new screen here, is sometimes, let's say I take an image, and here's my image field. And the first image I take, which I'm going to represent in red, I see a star here, a star here, a star here, a star. And I'm pretty sure these are all stars. But who knows if I'm right or I'm wrong. So the next time I observe, I look, and there's star here, 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 star here. Next time I observe it, what I see is instead star here, 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 nothing there, star here. So what I'm finding in reality is I have objects that move. And with if you're just looking for things that move, and things that move can be asteroids, uh, depending on how fast you're making your observations, they could be comets, they could be planets, lots of things move, they all move at different rates. We can figure out where they are by how fast they move across the sky. Um, by taking a whole bunch of different observations and looking for the things that change in position from observation to observation, we can find all the stuff that's moving in the sky. Um, so this is, this is kind of cool. Um, yes, I know the sun appears daily. I'm still annoyed by it. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to figure out what you're discussing in the chat, and I'm deeply confused. Um, I'm I'm going to move on and say yes. I too can work out exactly where the sun will appear daily. It's a homework problem. I believe I was forced to do once. Um, and I am grateful for the sun as well. It it makes me a happier person that it exists because it gives me vitamin D, which one needs. Um, and um, it looks like you guys are just having a, a, a good conversation. So I'm not going to try and figure this out. Um, so so the next part of the software that, that I'm working on writing with Big J is uh, now that we have, now that he has, uh, I just told him what needed to be done. He did all of the bits of, of making it happen. Um, his software will currently identify where things are in a field. So as I said a moment ago, the next step is we're going to measure the full width half max. I think he has it doing this now. We're going to measure the counts. And this will allow us to start getting at how individual objects that may or may not be moving change in brightness over time. The other thing that we want to do is find the objects that are moving. And they can also change in brightness over time. So for instance, let's say that I had a turtle-shaped asteroid. Because why not? Um, 
it's turtles all the way down after all. So here's my turtle shaped asteroid. If my turtle shaped asteroid is facing straight towards us like this, it doesn't have a whole lot of surface area. So the amount of sunlight that it can reflect back towards us is kind of minimal. Now, if our turtle rotates when his shell is forwarding, his shell is facing towards Earth. He has a lot more surface area to reflect sunlight back. So our rotating turtle over time will actually reflect different amounts of sunlight towards Earth. And this allows us to measure the rotation rate of asteroids or turtles simply by how they reflect light over time. So by measuring the changing positions, we can get at the orbits. By measuring the changing brightness, we can get at the rotation rates. And we're doing all of this while taking pretty pictures, which I just love when you can combine science and beauty um, and do cool things that are fun to share. So, so yeah, this is, this is what we're doing. Um, so, so Cosmic Lettuce, I love IRAF. I absolutely adore IRAF. IRAF has made every single one of my graduate astronomy students that I've asked to use it cry. I don't like crying grad students. Um, so, so let me go ahead and I'm going to pull up um, the poster that Big J and I did to present at AAS last week that discussed this software. Um, Pardon me while I search my hard drive because I removed it from the desktop. So Big J has it totally right. We are doing this because I am tired of graduate students crying and NASA is apparently also tired of graduate students crying. They put out a call for proposals last year and in their call for proposals, they, they literally said they wanted easy to use open source software um, that could be used for asteroids and could be used um, for transient objects. So this is the way I summed it up. Whoa, I zoomed out too far. So your normal problem is you need so software that will measure brightness, that's photometry, will measure position, that's astrometry. And the software that's out there right now is either super expensive, by which I mean the cheapest that I can find that I'm willing to use is $600 of the commercial software um, that has all the features I need. Um, IDL is like they scale the price by how big your institution is and you cry while you pay your bill every month. So tears. Um, the other solution is things like IRAF and PIRAF. Um, which have made all of my graduate students who do astronomy cry. I now have computer science graduate students. I so far haven't made them cry, for which I am grateful. Um, at least not that I have seen. Um, and, and making students cry because they're fighting with software rather than struggling to understand the universe. You want you want everyone who's doing science to focus the majority of their efforts on the doing science part, not on the super steep learning curve of software, because not all of us are technological geeks. I got to use IRAF for the first time when I was a Kit Peak REU student back during the summer of Shoemaker Levy 9. So that was the summer of 94. And it was awesome. It made perfect sense to me. I flippered a lot because, well, we needed to make sure that the right things happened. Um, no, it's not crying out of happiness. I've never seen one of my students cry out of happiness. Um, I wish, I wish. So most people, rather than put up with IRAF, um, and because most of us don't have a lot of money, um, the solution is, F it, I'm going to write my own software. This is why Python exists. But most of us aren't trained in software development. Um, I actually have a minor in computer science. I have been programming since I was a teenager. I'm one of those weird hacker children. But that's not everyone. And if you take your normal person who just wants to be an astronomer, who spent all of school studying stars, galaxies, the dust between the stars and the galaxies, they may not have put all of that time into also learning how to like make their computer play the theme song from 
uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind because it was fun when they were in fifth grade, which is something I did. And it's a waste to make them learn how to program computers just so they can get at their science. So we're trying to create a new and improved solution that gives people open source software that they can easily add new libraries to if they want to, that other programmers can get involved with. But your average scientist can use to do all the science they need without having to pay large sums of money, without having to cry because they can't figure out where that one parameter is hidden that will save their files in the correct format. This has actually reduced one of my students to tears. Um, we want we want people to be able to focus on their science instead of focusing on fighting their software. So this is what we're doing. Um, I I have to admit, Paranor, um, I when I was little, I the first time I was like learning to program in BASIC in a um, uh, I think it was some sort of a Tandy computer. I don't even remember exactly which it was. Um, I figured out you could make noises with it and so I did Close Encounters and then when I was in eighth grade, my eighth grade gifted and talented program was I somehow convinced my teacher to let me write Battlestar Galactica fan fiction and film it and uh, because I couldn't exactly afford to go to Industrial Light and Magic, um, I used Logo to draw vipers and then I figured out how to turn the turtle into a group of vipers and fly them around on the screen. So I did Battlestar Galactica in eighth grade. I've been a nerd for a long time. Um, and, and I saw that point about uh, show me an average scientist. So here, here's the thing you need to think about. Like I, as a human being, compared to the vastness, vastness of humanity, am really damn good at math. Compare me to the entire bin of PhD holding astrophysicists and I am well below average and I acknowledge this. So within any given group you have what the average of the group is and all of us have our superpowers, those things that we're really good at. Um, for me my superpowers are my ability to communicate and my ability to force computers to do my bidding. And this is where I'm lucky. And I, unfortunately, am equally matched in I might have a couple of different superpowers, but then I can't spell to save my life. And I'm not as good at math as your typical astronomer is. So this means there is a typical astronomer how good you are at computer programming. And the typical computer programmer can hack code to do what they have to. But they're not going to write anything entirely sophisticated. They're not going to write anything fancy. They're just going to get done what they have to get done and the code is going to be ugly. And that's okay. That's, that's not their superpower. There are people out there whose superpowers are un understanding the magnetic fields around black holes. There are people out there whose superpowers are understanding how to optimize telescopes so that uh, the software compensates for how much gravity is trying to flux the telescope as you track across the sky. Everyone has a different skill. My skill with programming allows other people to do better science. And so it's only by all of us working together to do all these different things that we're able to understand the universe. And because I recognize I'm really good at this one thing. And I can find computer science grad students who can join me in being good at writing software. We can solve a problem to make it easier for everyone else, those average astronomers who don't have a computer science superpower. We can make it easier for them. So, so this is how we all work together. Um, and open software really is how we are going to have to start doing more and more things in the future. Um, because let's face it, 
when you look at the U.S. budget, when you look at the international budgets in most of the developing worlds, the budget going to science isn't increasing faster than um, inflation. So we don't have the money left to keep buying software. We need to find other things to spend our money on. So, so this is what we're doing. We are, we're writing software. Um, so, so I see, I'm going to work on answering questions and probably rounding down, winding down this, this hangout. I see Octahoran asking, do you and Fraser ever team up to solve programming challenges? He does have a computer science background. Um, I haven't seen him program in all the years I've known him other than for homework assignments. I know he can program, but he really, uh, his superpower is writing. Um, I have that power as well, not to the same degree he does. Um, his actual superpowers are in um, seeing how to transform an idea into a fully, fully realized reality. Uh, he's the kind of person where if you want to start a company, you go, how do I start my company? And he's like, well, you do this, 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 and this. That is Fraser's superpower. Um, so, so we are going to be doing coding challenges with other people over time. Just, it's probably never going to be me versus Fraser. I like him. That would be mean. Um, I'm actually the one that does all of our coding for Astronomy Cast. So I do our website and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, so we all, we all have our different things. Um, so, uh, Man of Steel is asking, how's Trump for astronomy? We don't know yet. Um, so to be entirely honest, we do avoid politics, but that one I can answer with, we don't know. Um, we haven't passed a budget since he's been president. Um, so don't know. Um, so that's awesome, Cosmic Lettuce. And I, if you're the Cosmic Lettuce, I think you are. You're another podcaster that podcasts for us in 365 Days of Astronomy. I don't know if you're the same Cosmic Lettuce. Um, so um, if you are, thank you for being one of our podcasters. Um, and and yes, uh, our last Astronomy cast that we recorded, um, I, I was the one... Um, producing the show and it turned out that I didn't get to prep as well for the show because I was producing the show so we're probably going to have Fraser do the production from now on um but um yeah Fraser is so used to like being the software puppet master not the human puppet master um so so Octacore and I don't know about Trump but Mike Pence is like he has been regularly visiting the various NASA centers so Mike Pence I do know he touched something he shouldn't have touched. Um, Mike Pence clearly enjoys at least going to the NASA centers. I can't say anything other than that about anything else. Um, so thank you for joining Dodgy Blaster. Um, it's been great having you here. So I should probably work on winding up as well. Um, but do you have any more final questions before I round out this stream? And I'll switch views over to the that view. So, so there has been a lot of talk about um, refocusing NASA to not be studying the Earth, which is weird. Um, to um and there was an executive i don't know if it was proclamation or what that trump does want to return human beings to the moon um so so the question is um what's that going to do to the science budget um so i do podcast regularly astronomy cast is um, recorded live most Fridays straight to our YouTube channel. Um, if you go to astronomycast.com, you can find links to everything. And our new episodes come out most Mondays. By most, I mean uh, we do go on hiatus every summer, and occasionally Fraser and I will both get sick at the same time and miss an episode. Um, but we try really, really hard to have during the school year a new episode every single Monday. Um, 
our recordings are more likely to get flexed around one or the other of us traveling. But in general, we record at noon Pacific, uh, 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, 8 p.m. London uh, every Friday afternoon. Um, and uh, on Twitch, um, so this isn't a podcast, it's a stream. I'm trying to figure out all the nomenclature myself. Uh, so here on CosmoQuest, uh, there are three of us that do streaming on this channel. Um, I am on every Tuesday evening at 8 p.m. Central, which is 9 Eastern, uh, 6 Pacific. Um, and I'm uh, on every Sunday at 11, 11 a.m. Central, noon Pacific. Uh, math, it's hard. Noon, so plus 5 p.m. London. 9 a.m. Pacific. Um, and then Matt Richardson, who is our team postdoc, he's a scientist down in Tennessee. Uh, he comes on at noon central, 1 Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on Wednesday and Friday. And Big J is starting to also stream here. Um, and there's actually an entire group of people who are doing education here on Twitch. It's the Brainy Bites team. Let me see if I can share the link to that. I just need to find a Twitter, uh, a sorry, a Chrome window. Brainy Bites Twitch. Let's see if that gets me there. Um, no. Okay. Let me try going straight to Twitch to find it. So we have a new team on Twitch called Brainy Bites, where we're trying to get a whole bunch of different people doing things. Um, so let me see Veronica, Veronica's questions. Yes, Veronica, that that's exactly what we're doing with our software. And um, we uh, send me an email uh, off list. Um, my my work email address for work related questions and what's cool is this stream is actually part of my everyday job um, i work for the astronomical society of the pacific um, i'm located in our illinois offices and the key is it's a international organization in the United States touches the Pacific. So even though the Il Illinois doesn't touch any ocean, um, we're still part of this international organization. Um, and I'm now looking for our Brainy Bites team. Let's see if I can find it. There we go, Brainy Bites TV. So if you go here, you can find more of the Twitch channels um, that uh, are, are streaming educational content. It's a whole variety of different content, variety of different qualities. We're a community, all trying to use Twitch to do education. Um, and yes, the Weekly Space Hangout crew, which is kind of our core group of people that we rely on to help us figure out what where we need to put our emphasis. Um, and they help us out with a lot of different things. Um, then, um, yeah, they, they go join them. They're great. That's all I can say. I become incoherent trying to discuss their greatness. Um, so, so we do do object oriented program. Um, I haven't done that in a while because I've been working in other languages doing other things, but yeah. Um, so yeah. Are there any other questions? Second question, what programming language will be in 20 years? I can't answer that. I can't tell you what the key programming language will be in two years. Um, I'm kind of surprised C is still a thing. Um, because I learned to program um, in university and see I actually started in other languages in school. Um, but yeah, there's a whole, it, it's, there's no way to, pre to predict technology. I, I filled out a survey the other day that uh, asked 
um, would I be able to serve on a committee in all these different capacities? And one of the capacities was to advise the organization on uh, future technologies. And uh, I wrote a comment basically along the lines of, I'm not checking this box because I don't think this can be done on the time scales you're worried about because um, the committee would be looking at things three, four, five years down the line. And I think it's possible to develop an organization to be constantly nimble and able to jump onto new technologies. I think this is something that we've worked really hard and been fairly good at doing with CosmoQuest. I don't think it's possible to train an organization to be prepared a year in advance for what technology is going to be in a year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just one of those things. Um, Larry, you and I need to talk at some point about why you consider C a massive setback. Um, it's, it's rock solid language for a lot of things. Um, SAS is the devil. I just want to lay that out there, keeper of maps. SAS is the devil. Um, and it's true in 20 years, uh, AI may create programming languages for us. Um, it's AIs are already starting to beget AIs. Um, that's, that's the world we live in. So I, I had to learn Pascal as well, Veronica, my, um, senior, uh, computer science class in high school was all about Pascal. Um, yeah, I remember I had to borrow one of my dad's old windows machines. It was one of those compacts that is shaped like a, checkable suitcase and weighs more than you're allowed to check and the keyboard pops off to reveal a little tiny green screen monitor um yeah i i i think pascal caused you to have a different emotional reaction depending on when you learned it and on what platform you were using it um i remember i actually wrote software to do uh something related to Battlestar Galactica because again I was that kind of a nerd um <laughs> so um yeah we all have our favorites we all have our most hated um uh the L stands for Lynn like almost all females born in the early 70s my middle name is Lynn I don't know what was in the water but um there's a whole generation of us with the middle name Lynn um <laughs> and yes, found period expecting semicolon is a common problem in software development. Um, <laughs> Larry, you triggered Automod. Um, I've released you from Automod. Um, so, so if there's not really any more questions, um, I'm, I'm. <laughs> Yes, we're bored four months apart, Big J. Um, oh, that's an idea. I'd never thought of that, Paranor. Um, so, okay. Um, I, I'm i going to go work on um, being confused by the chat. Um, and I'm sorry, Keeper of Maps, you shouldn't feel old. Um so, uh, my home office is currently covered in telescopes and paint flex. Um, I'm going to work on trying to keep these two things separate and, um, catching up on email and all my other normal Sunday tasks. And thank you all for joining. And if you're looking for something to spend your Sunday afternoon doing, um, do science. I invite all of you to join us at cosmoquest.org where you can help us map out other worlds. You can help us map you can help us map out the moon and Mars and Mercury and even our own planet Earth. Um, so go check out cosmoquest.org and um, I'll see you online Tuesday night if I don't see you sooner. So thanks for joining me. And have a great morning, evening, or afternoon, wherever you may be in the world. Thanks.